so it took a little longer to get onto Pacific Standard Time uh, than I thought. So um, I'm a little late here, but here is the final installment. Um, we made our move from Prague to our final destination, Berlin. One of the things that made this trip so easy is that public transit is just fantastic in Europe. Um, and the train station, the main train station in uh, Berlin, is really quite beautiful and modern. We needed to um, pick up some Kleenex when we got there, so we stopped by a drugstore, and lo and behold, I found out that my name is the name of a popular cigarette and chewing tobacco company. Um, yeah, so you never know what you're going to see when you travel. In our first day in Berlin, we took public transit to an adjoining town. The two have just about grown together at this point, called Potsdam. And Potsdam was where uh, Friedrich the Great um, set up his absolutely fantastic uh, set of pleasure palaces and garden complex. And this was a really, really big garden complex. What you're looking at here is uh, two interior shots um, from his original uh, residence, uh, Schloss Sanssouci, um, and on the right here, you can see the very, very pronounced Rococo style, um, pretty much the the most amazing Rococo outside of uh, France, um, so much so that German Rococo is sort of its own category, um, and on the wall you see the largest collection of uh, Watteaus outside of France. It was really pretty amazing. Some of the details that you can see uh, get very, very intricate. And um, I know it's hard to see in this small slide, um, but coming out from the center here, this is actually a web that then goes into a perspectival building over here with little scenes like people fishing in the corner, all made uh, of uh, gilt gold. Really um, so ornate that one's eyes almost need a rest between. The final room, uh, if you book a room on the uh, Schloss Sanssouci uh, tour, um, will be a place that is of high interest to those who um, are interested in Orientalism in uh, Imperial Europe. On the mantel, you can see um, fine porcelain wares from the east. Um, and on the wall, you can see that those decorative patterns have now been turned into beautiful painted relief, and to demonstrate that they're relief and not just paintings, I'm going to point to the shadows here on the trim on the roof. It's a really amazing spot, but that was not the most orientalist spot that we saw um, in Potsdam. Further away, there is that was not the most orientalist thing that we saw that day, though. Um, this is what was referred to as the Chinese house. Uh, as you can see, the architecture is part, and uh, you see a little column column in here, part um, sort of Rococo, uh, European style, mixed with um, what people had ideas uh, about being Asian styles at the time, um, including these gold statues and the parasol figure on the ceiling, or on the roof. When you get up close, it just looks incredible. Um, it's a very European style of sculpture, but here you can see uh, what was thought to be a sort of Chinese mandolin, and of course the gold and the, the green, uh, very, very Asian. Inside, there are really interesting frescoes all over uh, the ceiling and the walls, um, which were depicting sort of fanciful Asian style scenes. Um, you can really see that taste that uh, Rococo rulers had for all things exotic. Um, now, Asian culture continues to have a very strong influence on parts of Europe, and uh, it's more of a back and forth at this point. This was something that um, we'd been looking forward to for quite some time. One of the most popular casual dishes in Germany right now is uh, the currywurst. Um, and as you can see here, there is a traditional type of sausage here, sometimes that sausage actually includes curry itself, with a curry and Worcestershire um, ketchup sauce on it served with fries and, of course, beer. Um, we actually had this meal in a World Heritage building 
that houses uh, a restaurant that used to be actually used um, as the sort of main serving halls um, to to cook the food um, for Potsdam, uh, which is directly below it. Traveling is always a mixture of those things which you plan intensely and of course then being open to opportunities that present themselves while you're out and about. And this is something that we almost miss. This is Sam Lung Burroughs. Um, the building that you see on the right is actually right in front of our hotel. I mean, it's literally next door. And I found out about this relatively late in the trip. It's actually now a private gallery um, that only allows in 12 people on guided tours. There are no names or information on the wall, and it's private residence still, so it, uh, it, it, they need to be these guided tours. And every other tour is German or English. So you have to have a, an appointment sometimes weeks in advance. We got super lucky. Um, I had actually found that this place was really close to the hotel, but that it was booked for seven weeks solid um, after we were going to be arriving in Berlin. And I checked and checked and checked, and finally there was a cancellation, it turned out, on that first day we were in Berlin. So we had to move things around in order to make it happen, but it was absolutely fantastic. So I only have a couple of pictures of the inside because the collection itself is private, and like I said, it's a private residence, and so they don't allow photography within the collection. Um, but the way that you come in, you're actually guided by this installation of these large poles, um, and this gives you an idea of what it looks inside with the original bunker doors um, and the low ceiling and heavy ferro-concrete that is a steel and concrete structure. Not only was this one of the best modern collections that I've seen, I mean, the, the, the Boros family have tremendous taste. Um, I recognized a number of the artists from uh, Venice Biennale's that I'd been to um, and other very, very modern shows. Um, they had fantastic taste. They also, um, though, picked a building of historical significance. This is the only um, Nazi-era bomb shelter left on the East Berlin side of Berlin. Um, and it's built so thick that it could withstand the the uh, artillery and the bombs of the time. So it's not below ground, it's above ground. It was designed by uh, Albert Spears, who was one of the main architects of Nazi Germany. Um, and you can see it's got, um, it's really five floors. Um, they say four floors, but that's because the ground level is the ground, and it goes one, two, three, four, five, uh, or one, two, three, four, which is the fifth. Um, and then on top, they have built their own residence, which is just super cool. Um, and you wouldn't know that this place was a gallery, um, except for this one boulder blocking your entrance. Um, it was one of the highlights of the tour. And again, if I hadn't been open to change, um, and if we hadn't lucked out and somebody hadn't canceled the last minute, this just would have been something that we wouldn't have been able to do. That evening we took a walk that toured two walls of historical significance in Berlin. Most of the Berlin Wall that uh, people would be familiar with, uh, the Cold War era wall, um, has been torn down, and if you had to live through that, you'd probably want to get rid of most of it, too. Um, but here's a little detail where you can see uh, an art piece that, that s sort of signifies the route that the wall took, leading up to a portion of the wall, um, and then on the back side, that's actually the East Berlin Wall back there. You can see there's a large sort of demilitarized zone between the two that people who wanted to escape from the East would actually have to get over and then get over the wall that is on the west side here. Um, I'm contrasting that with the other Berlin Wall, which most people don't know about, which is one of the only 13th century structures left. Um, Berlin really starts in the, the 12th century, but there's not much left from the 13th, um, partially just because of building and, and of uh, partially because of major bombing. Um, but here you can see a fairly modern house running into a bit of the original Berlin Wall. We spent our second day in the Gamalda Gallery, which was uh, a phenomenal collection. And uh, that's me in front of a set of 
um, Van Eyck paintings, and you can see how tiny these things are. Um, no matter how big they had been reproduced for me in the uh, the past, I had a hard time seeing the detail, and it was tr great just to be able to loom in front of these things and really examine them uh, at my own pace. The gallery itself is part of a, a larger set of museum structures that you enter with one ticket. In fact, we got a pass, a 72-hour pass for um, Berlin Museums, which turned out to be one heck of a deal. Um, this place is laid out in this beautiful modern structure, and then each one of these doors leads you into a gallery where you might be in a room that's mostly Botticelli's, or you might be in a room where you see one of the best Caravaggio's, in my opinion, ever. Um, just a phenomenal collection. The next day, we headed off to Schloss Charlottenburg, um, which is under heavy uh, construction right now in the front, and the new wing is closed. So I'm just giving you that little picture off to the side. This was our last really big look at German Rococo. And I'm just going to show you one highlight, though it was a pretty incredible sight in and of itself. Um, this is a very, very early piano with uh, Asian themes on the side, uh, mostly blue, but a little bit of red mimicking the uh, porcelain designs that would come over in uh, chinoiserie. The rest of the uh, next two days, for the most part, we spent on Museum Island, which had been one uh, of our major objectives in taking this trip. This is a shot looking up into Museum Island. You can actually see here's one bank and here's the other. And then there's, uh, I think, seven museums uh, five really major ones on this island, um, a, a beautiful church. It, it is um, just an absolutely gorgeous spot, but it's under really heavy construction right now. Um, apparently, they're going to link all of these museums with a structure that's uh, supposed to rival uh, what you would get going to uh, Paris, where there's a, a, a beautiful glass pyramid um, that you can see the structures under the Louvre with. Um, so they want a similar uh, sort of modern grandeur. Uh, it will be very interesting. But in the meantime, lots of things are under construction or closed. Um, and I think there's another five years or six years of work until this thing is finished. What we really wanted to see was the Pergamon Museum there. Now we did see the old museum, we saw the new museum, we saw the Boda, um, so we did our best to um, really take advantage of being on the island, um, but I wanted to see the Pergamon altar, which is just about to close for restoration for the next five years. So it was do it now, or do it in half a decade. Um, and this is an incredible museum in and of itself. There are several full pieces or at least facades of um, large architectural structures which then um, are seated inside another building. Um, the Pergamon Altar is a 2nd century BCE Hellenistic temple from uh, Pergamon which is in modern day Turkey um, and as you can see the entire front of this thing a uh, few humans for scale to, to, to give you an idea how big it is. The whole front facade of this thing including the, the sculptures uh, are here for you to, to view in Germany. This is a pretty exceptional piece. I was really floored by the way that the sculptures actually move and lunge and rest their weight on the stairs as they move up the, uh, the, the front staircase. Uh, just absolutely incredible. This gives you an idea of how some of the, the sculptural relief has been set up that you can take a look at. This is me standing at the top of that staircase. Um, and you can see I'm looking down and there's a group of people here. And then there's sculpture along the back wall. And on the left and on the right, there's sculpture that moves to both sides, which has preserved the uh, relief that would have wrapped uh, the entire building, or at least most of the entire building. Um, and I was familiar with particular scenes um, from this relief, but going to see this really gave me an idea of how amazing this sculptural program was. Um, this is a really famous scene with Zeus um, in a battle of the Olympian gods versus uh, the Titans, and here is Athena. Um, and I really had enjoyed the composition in both 
areas um, that you can see there's hev heavy damage and lost areas on either side so people kind of sometimes talk about them as if they're individual compositions. Um, what I hadn't really realized is how much there was a V composition running between the two and you could see relationships as you um, walked past between several of the sections that um, you might be familiar with um, in more of an in-situation kind of setting. Uh, you can also see things like this 2nd century CE ancient Roman market gate from Miletus. You can see things like the 6th century BCE Ishtar gates from Babylon on the left, or on the right, the 8th century CE facade of the Mishata Palace. Um, this is like no other museum I've ever been to. I'm going to give it a 10 out of 10, even though I only got to see two-thirds of it some of it is under uh, sort of reconstruction and conservation right now so I will have to return when everything is done and see the whole thing all over again that sounds like a tough job we ended our trip with another um, opportunity that we really hadn't realized um, and this is uh, an image of the the Reichstag um, if you are a modern art person you probably uh, recognize it as being wrapped by Christo and Jean-Claude. Um, this is what it looks like unwrapped. Um, and it's a pretty uh, interesting building. Um, it's neoclassical, neo-Renaissance design. Uh, it had been a very important building uh, in the past in terms of Germany's governmental structures. Um, and then it kind of went quiet uh, for a while um, and is now an important symbol all over again uh, and this time with modern additions. So you can see the original structure below and then you see this incredible dome on the top. So what we had found out is that one can make reservations and walk in a, a, a helix one way, it's actually a double helix, one way up and then down the other uh, and get a really good view of the city from the top as well as some information about how the parliamentary system works uh, in Germany. Here's a look at from the top down at the interior of the dome. This is actually glass that is uh, allowing in natural light um, to the, uh, the chambers below where uh, discussions are being had. Uh, there was a grating that rotated around it to block uh, direct sunlight so there wouldn't be heat problems. There's reflective glass above that allows that light to funnel down at all other times. Um, and the whole thing operates as a ventilation system for the interior of the place. It's really intriguing. You have this sort of 19th century structure right next to the very, very modern. And in many ways, that's Berlin. You know, Berlin took heavy damage, uh, especially in World War II, uh, and that it's been a long time uh, that that Berlin had to be in sort of a, a time capsule, at least on the eastern side, where there wasn't a tremendous amount of modern building. Today, Germany's economy is in the ascendancy, and uh, it was amazing to watch how much sort of construction and remodeling is going on now. Um, really, really fantastic place. So that does it for uh, this year's um, travel log. Don't know if I'll have one uh, in the next year. Um, thanks for listening.